All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our study of Ezra. We did the preliminary materials last week, and now this week we'll be getting into the text itself, starting at chapter 1, verse 1. Before we do that, let's have an invocation and prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, well, by way of preface, of course, um, we're going to, uh, if, you'll, if you'll glance again at page 719, you'll see the timeline there. Of course, um, 587 is when the Jerusalem temple is destroyed. And then 538 BC, Cyrus decrees that the exiles may return to Judah. So we are right there in that history. Of course, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he was responsible. And, and of course, it's the Babylonian exile. So they came down, they broke the temple, they swept away um, uh, Judah. And then, of course, Persia comes and conquers Babylon. And so you have this leader, Cyrus, um, who is the king of Persia. And he is really the first figure that pops up in chapter 1, verse 1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So again, hopefully that gives you just a little bit of a brief introduction today. We went through that more thoroughly last week. And what we have here in these first couple chapters is some really kind of technical stuff. I'm going to be referring to the study notes a lot. There's a lot of details and um, a lot of names. <laughs> Look ahead to chapter 2 and you'll see what I mean. Um, and, and so we're going to just mosey our way through as best we can, trying to, trying to go along as we can. So chapter 1, verse 1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, <coughs> so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Well, what do we see here? We see in the first place that the context is God's judgment upon his people. Judah is finally swallowed up by Babylon. They've broken the covenant over and over again. God gives them over uh, to their desires. To You want to be a pagan nation? You'll be a pagan nation. You'll be conquered by pagan nations. And so all of this takes place, but in relatively short order, God immediately has a plan to restore his people and restore the temple. Now, it does go on for some decades, I mean, just approximately 50 years. Okay, so there is, there is uh, some decades where the people are making themselves at home at Babylon. Babylon become Persia, okay? And, um, you know, maybe, maybe too, it would be helpful to skip back to page 717 in your Lutheran Study Bible. And if you look at that map, you'll see off to the, the very right hand, and in fact, the furthest rightmost name on that map is Persia. And so you can see 
um, where Persia comes from, and of course its conquest off to the west, um, including conquest of Jerusalem. Um, immediately to Persia's left is Babylon, and so you can see how they conquered Babylon, and then continued west, conquering um, and taking over all that Babylon had previously had, including Jerusalem. So that'll give you a sort of uh, a, a map, a visual image in your mind of where Persia is located, where Cyrus is, and uh, where these decrees are coming from. All right, and um, of course we've got we've got God's mercy then coming relatively swiftly to His people, and that He's going to call them back have them rebuild the temple. Um, and of course, this is a fulfillment, as verse 1 alludes to, of the word of the Lord proclaimed by the mouth of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14, we can point to as an example of that. And we see here, too, that it is the Lord doing the doing. Thoroughly. It's the Lord who through the mouth of Jeremiah promises this time in which God will lift the judgment from his people such that the temple can be reestablished. And then it is God who stirs up the king of Cyrus, this pagan king. Now, the, the king of Cyrus is, um, you know, he, even though he alludes to Yahweh, the God of, uh, the God of heaven and the God of Judah, the God of Jerusalem. He himself is kind of polytheistic, tolerant of all religions. He's got no problem, you know, using the, using these titles for Yahweh, even though, you know, they're kind of, he's just like, yeah, I'll take them all, whatever. I'm a, I'm a big king. I've got a lot of people under me. They all worship different gods. Great. But what, what, what we want to see is that, is that God is the one who stirs up this king of Persia to do this miraculous thing, allowing the temple to be rebuilt. Um, and what we see here, of course, is that there's a little bit of irony in that he calls him the God of heaven. Cyrus calls him the God of heaven, even though Cyrus doesn't really even believe this. We do. We know that, that, um, that it is God who is be behind the scenes working all of these things. And Cyrus is aware of that to some degree too, even though he just does not attribute full credit to Yahweh. All right, so just uh, digging, into <laughs> digging into the study notes here a little bit. If you look at the study note on verse 1-1, one, one, Cyrus, founder of the Persian Empire, located between the Persian Gulf and the Caspian Sea, far east of the Holy Land. Iran was formerly known as Persia. So that would give you a sense in terms of a contemporary map where Persia was. We're talking about basically Iran. Cyrus triumphed over the Babylonians at Opus on the Tigris River and captured the city of Babylon, October of 539 BC. In 538 BC, he allowed exile Judeans, uh, Judeans to return home before anyone knew that the name uh, uh, knew the name of this conqueror the lord had anointed cyrus to quote fulfill all his purpose end quote and then you can see the notes on isaiah uh, chapter 44 verses 27 and 28 verses 28 so isaiah jeremiah they're all talking about cyrus prophesying god had foretold the end of the 70 year exile um, see your note on Second Chronicles 36.21. So all said and done, you've got uh, a 70-year exile. If you just look at the time from the temple is destroyed to the time of the decree, that's about 50 years. And when you add another um, 20 years to that and you have the altar rebuilt in Jerusalem, that's how you get 70 years. All right, Luther's commentary on this little section. Here the flesh is greatly offended. It cannot understand the counsel of God about miraculously fulfilling these promises. The Lord had promised an eternal kingdom, a glorious return from captivity. All the Jews, therefore, kept thinking that they would be saved and brought back, that they would be placed in that new and glorious kingdom. Only very few of the devout were, after some years, brought back from Babylon, namely those whose spirit God had touched.
touched, as the account in Ezra 1.5 says. Therefore, he is separating the faithful from the wicked and says that the latter will remain in an eternal captivity while the former will be brought back and glorified. Thus far, Luther. And he's jumping ahead to verse 5, which we'll hit here in just a minute. So we can see um, that God can indeed work uh, miraculously through political leaders that believe in him or don't believe in him or whatever. And so we can um, lift up our prayers to God that uh, there's not the same, the same promises that God made to ancient Israel to restore them from captivity. He's made no such promises to Christians scattered around the globe. And yet, nonetheless, we can cry out to him and pray to him that he would, um, through the hand of uh, secular leaders, uh, bless his church and allow us to prosper. Don't want to say much more than that, but that's, um, that's kind of how this text opens with this decree from Cyrus. And then we see the response in verse 5 to which Luther alluded. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin. Those are the two tribes that consisted of Judah as we've been referencing it. And the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Fascinating. The people had these promises from Jeremiah that this was going to occur. Then it occurs. Cyrus gives his proclamation that you can go do this. Why don't all of them go? There's two ways of answering that. Luther says in the, in the first hand that those who don't go are rejecting that promise. They, they're not faithful. They've lost the promise of God. They don't believe that that promise is going to come true. When it does come true, they've lost it and they'd rather stay, as Luther very poetically puts, in an eternal exile. Now, why do, why do some go? Because they made a free will decision? No, that's not the language. It's very fascinating, isn't it, how it's parallel to kind of our conversations about uh, salvation and, and damnation. Um, but be, specifically, the text says, because God had stirred them up. Everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord. So if you remain in Babylon, who's... Whose fault? Yours. And, and if you go, who gets the credit? God, who stirred your, your heart up to go. All right. So a remnant, a remnant, as it were, returns. Verse 6, and all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus king of Persia brought these out in the charge of Mithradath the treasurer who counted them out to Sheshbazar the prince of Judah. And this was the number of them, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylon, uh, Babylonia to Jerusalem. All right, well, if you do the math there, it doesn't equal 5,400. <laughs> so there were others. This is, um, this is one of two occasions just right off the bat in these early chapters where we're going to see where, um, you know, the, you can see the way that the author is using numbers. Like here are the specific pieces, but it was this many in total. I'm not going to list all of them out. He does the same thing in um, chapter 2, verse 64, when he's talking about um, the whole assembly of this group that goes um, is, is listed as 42,360. And then after he's, he's kind of added up all the different types, um, you don't get that figure. <laughs> so it's just an interesting curiosity about, uh, about our author here. 
Okay, well, I don't want to lose the forest for the trees. Are we tracking with generally what's going on here, and not only in terms of the historic narrative, but in terms of what God is up to, what God is doing? Everything is as clear as it can be, I hope. Any, any thoughts, any questions? Everyone's okay, generally? All right. Now, we're going to skip over a giant section here because I don't think you want to hear me spe you know, spend about eight minutes up here mispronouncing Hebrew names. <laughs> so bear with me as we kind of clumsily work our way through this next section, chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1, Now these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel is a very important person. We heard of this figure, Sheshbazar. Now, he was the appointed governor of Judah by Cyrus. So he's kind of the, the prince, as it were, of Judah. But he very quickly disappears and is replaced by Zerubbabel. So you can, um, if you look down at the note on chapter 2, verse 2, on Zerubbabel, later governor of Judah and active in rebuilding the temple. Okay, then Jeshua. Now, interestingly, the study note doesn't point this out, but Jeshua is a name that factors, looms large in the, in the coming chapters here um, because Jeshua is the high priest. Now, is this the same Jeshua? The only study note I could find seems to indicate the name was so common that who knows? Okay, um, Jeshua, of course, Joshua, and then also Jesus. That's his name, and so... Um, Yoshua, Yeshua, Jesus. So uh, that, that um, Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and then Nehemiah, if you drop down on, again on that same study note we were just looking at, bore the same name as the governor who arrived in Jerusalem some 90 years later, reference to Nehemiah 1.1. So this is probably that Nehemiah. Beyond that, um, these names don't factor that importantly from our perspective into the narrative. And then, of course, you see the number of the men of the people of Israel. And this is the part I'm going to skip here uh, from, from verse, um, yeah, I guess it would be the, basically the latter part of verse 3 all the way through maybe somewhere to 57, and we'll pick back up around there. Now, if you look at the study note on the um, text from chapter 2, verses 2 through 67, that study note, we'll get a little bit of an analysis and assessment of what these different groups are. So I'm just going to read that note. This list is a testimony to God's goodness in preserving the identity of his chosen people during their captivity in a foreign country. An important document, it represents a kind of charter of the newly founded province of Judah. New names and numbers may have been added from time to time to keep the record current. All right. So, in other words, what are we to see here and why was this recorded? I mean, this is a testimony to God's faithfulness and to God's grace and concretely located in these families in these historic names. So, I think it's worthwhile to simply point that out. I mean, heretofore, what has, uh, of what has Ezra consisted? Grace upon grace upon grace of God being faithful to his promises, working even through a pagan king, sustaining these families, leading the remnant out, well supplying them so that they'll be able to rebuild his temple. I mean, again, that's really what the point of Ezra has been, is God's gracious response. I, I mean, we walk together through Joshua through Judges, through First Kings, through Second Kings. Think of all the apostasy. Think of all the apostasy. I, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years of apostasy and wickedness and breaking of God's covenant. Finally, God says, that's it. I've got to punish you. And like 70 short laters, not even one generation passes. And he's like, okay, that's it. Punishment's over. And I mean, you can see here why we say that judgment is God's alien work. It's not really what he wants to do. He is slow to anger abounding in steadfast love. 
If he does anything to a fault, it's mercy to a fault. He's merciful to a fault. Even then, we wouldn't ever accuse God of a fault. But you can see how his proper work is showing mercy. You can see why that's just a theological axiom. If you study the scriptures on a macro or micro level, you cannot help but see it. It's also so strange when you hear people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a fire and brimstone God, merciless and just. It's like, what Old Testament are you reading? <laughs> His mercy is everywhere, even if it's not overtly spoken. It's everywhere in that he hasn't exacted justice upon his people. When he finally does, he immediately removes it in this extremely gracious and miraculous way. And that's really what Ezra is doing, is showing the mercy and the merciful heart of God. All right, um, where we left off in the middle of that note, just the nine different groups. So nine groups are distinguished in this list that I'm about to skip, because trust me, you don't want to hear my mispronunciations. Um, okay, first, the leaders. Next, quote unquote, men of the people of Israel. Some are listed by family names, others by towns. And again, this kind of thing is idiomatic. It tends to mean leaders. We don't really understand the structure all that much, but um, this kind of language tends to be either heads of households or something equivalent, or maybe even greater than that. All right, next group is the priests, followed by all Levites, followed by Levitical singers, followed by Levitical gatekeepers, followed by temple servants, followed by sons of Solomon's servants, followed by some people without certified family ties. All right, so even some, uh, some who are non-certifiable. They're able to come. Now, um, the note on uh, verse 58, which happens to be just to the right of this note, mentions two of these groups, um, two of the ones that maybe are most intriguing. The temple servants, who are these? They are descendants of the Gibeonites and other groups. You can see the notes all the way back to Joshua chapter 9 on that one, or 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And then Solomon's servants, well, who are these folks? These are descendants of Canaanite tribes who became Solomon's house slaves, reference to 1 Kings 9. All right, so now we have a little bit better sense of the different groupings of this uh, of this remnant who is headed back to Judah to rebuild. Let's, um, let's skip ahead then to verse 58. All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. The following were those who came up from Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adon, and Immer, though they could not prove their father's houses or their descent, whether they belonged to Israel, the sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, and the sons of Nakoda, 652. Also of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, and the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife from the daughter of Barzillai, the, Gide uh, the Gileadite, and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but they were not found there, and so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until there should be a priest to consult Urim and Thummim. Okay, you remember the Urim and Thummim. We don't really know about this, but we know that it was up to the priest to use this, and it was some sort of method by which Yahweh worked to let his yes or his no be known. Um, these, these groups that could not be verified if they were in fact priests, they're kind of put in this um, probation then. No, you're marked as unclean. You can't serve as priests until we can consult the Urim and Thummim and have it definitively from God in regard to your status. All right, verse 64, the whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337. And they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736, their mules were 245, their camels were 435, and their donkeys were... 
a whopping 6,720. Yeah, the note on, the study note on verse uh, 64, the total given is far larger than the sum of the individual contingents recorded in the previous verses. That sum would have equaled 29,818. Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 66 gives the same total, but the individual entries there add up to only 31,089. The names of some families or groups were evidently omitted from these lists. All right, parallel to what we saw before in regard to the vessels, there's some omission. Uh, verse 68, some of the heads of the families, when they came to the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings uh, uh, for the house of God to erect it on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury of the work uh, 61,000 derricks of gold, 5,000. One hundred priest garments. I'm very agnostic toward it all. I, I mean, obviously, I believe what the Word of God says, and I assert that. I think it is very likely to me that, as you said, this was the first formal entourage that was going down to do this, and probably it's very messy after that. Probably you have many more coming in after that, because we're talking about decades, decades before the temple is rebuilt. Well, we know some of the Jews decided to stay in Babylon, yes, too, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah so. some stayed. So, I, I mean, it's definitely conjecture. It's definitely guesswork. I think that this number is probably underwhelming. Yeah, I think that we would hope for more. But it is what it is, and God's going to work through that, and that has more to do with God's grace and God's ability to work through impossible circumstances and unlikely places and people in order to bring about whatever he wants to bring about. So that may well be kind of a subtext here is that this isn't enough. Um, yeah, there's even, yeah, yeah, I don't want to say too much because like I said, this point I'm making is really rather conjecture. It's uh, kind of guesswork at, at themes here in the text. I agree. It doesn't seem like very much. I think historically we could assume that over the next decades more come, and um, it seems to be obvious anyway. Well, maybe less is more because, you know, in the desert coming out of Egypt, uh, there was confusion and right. disorder, and when Moses, Moses went up on Sinai and he came down, there was, you know, so. What is that thing called the Pareti principle? Like 20% uh, of the people do 80% of the work? Maybe God just took the 20. <laughs> Pareto principle. I can't remember what that thing is called, but yeah, yeah. Um, maybe that's what he did. Maybe he just took the cream of the crop, the doers, and uh, he was going to go get it done. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, um, verse 70, and then we'll wrap up this chapter. Now the priests, the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their own towns, and all the rest of, uh, and all the rest of Israel in their towns. The note on, um, on 65 in regard to the singers, likely singers of, uh, for secular entertainment, not the sons of Asaph, referenced in verse 41, 
Um, females did not participate in temple worship, though they sang praises to God after the Exodus and had some role of service at the entrance to the tabernacle, Exodus 38, 8. Um, so interesting that, this, that the study note finds here um, secular singers, so apparently a few of the more popular rock bands accompanied, <laughs> accompanied the, uh, the entourage. Okay, anything, um, anything stand out to you that you want to discuss? Anything hit you as, um, well, maybe it all hits you as strange. I don't know. I don't want to ask that question. There's quite a lot here that's, um, you know, it's beautiful. It's, the, it's what God did and, and the ways, the people, the means, the method that he did this great miraculous work. Of course, he's the one doing all the doing. You can see that quite evidently from the text. Let's go into chapter 3, verse 1. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of uh, Jazadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, literally on its stand, um, so where it previously had been. For fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. Well, let's pause there. Someone please remind me in a few minutes where we left off. But this is, um, you know, this is a beautiful thing. So they build the altar before they even build the temple. That's first and foremost what they do. Their reason for doing so is because the peoples of the lands, the peoples who were living there at that time, uh, were hostile to them and hostile to what they were doing. They immediately sought God's help and aid that he would keep them safe as they were building uh, the temple. And so... Very interesting, even though I guess Cyrus had decreed this, maybe not everyone got the memo, maybe not everyone agreed. Um, and, you know, so there was some hostility there, to be sure. Um, as I mentioned, these two names, Jeshua and Zerubbabel, they factor very large. They're, they're mentioned um, in Haggai and, of course, very substantively in Zechariah. And in fact, these two names are, are of the utmost importance because you have kind of the king and the priest. And in these two men, you have types of, of Jesus in his, as king and priest, um, no doubt about it. Uh, and especially Jeshua, given that they share the name. So these, uh, these men are introduced then in these verses, as well as they're building the altar. Um, the peoples of the lands, let's see. Yeah, well, a few things we could look at. We could look at, if, you, if you're in the study Bible on verse 2, if you look at the very, very last line in that column of text, Zerubbabel and Jeshua became the leaders. Reference to chapter 5, verse 1 through 2. And then in regard to building the altar and after the, the, after the law of Moses, the man of God, follows the example of what Moses had commanded when the children of Israel first entered Canaan from Deuteronomy 27. Um, in its place, literally upon its base, the site where it formerly stood. And of course, the, retur the returnees wanted the altar built in order to have a place where they might gather to implore God's help against the surrounding peoples of the lands. And of course, what is uh, put back in place, the daily sacrifices, the tamid, uh, consisted of lambs with flour, oil, and wine. Now in verse 4, it says, And they kept the feast of booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new moon and, and at all the appointed feasts of the Lord 
and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon. You remember Tyre and Sidon on the coast, and so they're importing it in. This is also referenced in Solomon's building of the first temple, and so they're kind of, they just went back to that blueprint. They're back at it again. To bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Which is interesting, to some degree or another, he's funding this or helping, it seems. So, yeah, they, you know, I, I think it's, um, I don't want to belabor this, it's a fairly obvious point. Before they, the temple's even built, they've reconstructed the altar and they're going about their business as best they can. They've reinstituted the major feasts. Um, the, the Feast of uh, Booths is mentioned here. The others, of course, the, the second, the Passover or unleavened bread, that feast, and then last, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, the three major feasts. And these, um, yeah, and then the daily sacrifice. So they're going about their business um, as if the temple were already there. They're entrusting themselves to the Lord that the temple will come in due time. Any thoughts you have? Straightforward enough? Okay, I see a couple hands. That's good. Um, let's hit the vicar. He's probably got something insightful to add. Well, I think it's, I think it's significant that we see that the burnt offerings are going up morning and evening and especially the Feast of Booths, because that was celebrated uh, in remembrance of the Israelites coming out of the Exodus, mm -hmm. uh, or coming out of Egypt. And mm -hmm. so this is kind of like the Israelites here, the Judeans coming out from, going from death to life, coming out of the land of Egypt to the Promised Land, and now coming out of Babylon it's back to the Holy Land where the Messiah is going to come. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the fact that they're able to actually do the daily burnt offerings, you know, with the um, uh, the oil and the, the grain offerings and all these things, like God is actually now providing for them the means by which they can actually do this and have God dwell in their midst. Mm -hmm. So, you know, restoration all the way around, I think, yeah. here, which yeah, is really wonderful. Yeah, and themes of God's continued gracious provision. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Vicar kind of hit on my point, but my question was, and, and my point is, um, in order to fulfill Scripture, they had to get back there for the, you know, promised Messiah, didn't they? Is that uh, is that not correct? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. I mean, in the overarching, yeah, yeah in the big, overarching big sense, absolutely right. Yeah, so, so you can see God's gracious provision tied into the geographical locale of uh, Jerusalem and of the temple. And these things are of necessity for, um, for the coming of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus and the events uh, surrounding um, his, rede his redemption of us. And then, and then the geography changes, doesn't it? Um, no longer a, a temple made with hands in Jerusalem, but the temple of our Lord's body and blood accessible wherever his sacrament is. Um, and, and then us as living stones built into that, into that temple such that we even become his body, we even become members of the temple, parts of the temple. Yeah, so it all, it all becomes um, sort of uh, ageographical. Um, but up until that point, uh, ge geography is of necessity. Mm -hmm. Pastor, is Ezra the architect, or is he the agent through which God is using to organize all this, or is there somebody else at this point? Well, I, th you know, I don't, I don't know, Barry. Maybe, maybe you have a better sense for that than even I do. I, heretofore in the text, he's he's playing a minor role. Okay. Um, the major, the major movers are, um, and I think increasingly so in this early chapter, are shown to be uh, Jeshua and Zerubbabel. Um, not to say that that Ezra might not be doing a lot. He may in fact be doing a lot. It's just, I don't, it's not in the text heretofore okay. at this point. Um, yeah, maybe that's the best answer I can Of course, it's get. going to evolve into Nehemiah, who 
is involved in building the wall. That's later, but the right, of the temple being built, I guess. Okay, so we'll. Right. Yeah. As we'll see, I mean, there's uh, the rebuilding of the temple starts right as early as the next couple verses, but then it's halted and then restarted, and yeah, there's um, of course there's some drama with all of that. When you get to uh, verse, or excuse me, verse, um, chapter 7, you start to see um, focus and emphasis on the ministry of Ezra proper. So not to say that he wasn't doing that before, but chapter 7, you'll even see by the, by the heading given by the editors, Ezra sent to teach the people. And so this is, um, it really continues through the conclusion of this, uh, of this book. Um, but it, so it kind of shifts then to Ezra's emphasis, and his work, his particular role. Okay, all set to go on. Chapter 3, verse 8. Now in the second year after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Josadak made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. So going all the way back to um, how David had directed them to inaugurate the temple as it was um, going to be built, um, they're doing the same thing here. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. And then here is their verse, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the peoples shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Ah, very interesting part. Verse 12, but many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses Old men who had seen the first house wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say anything about it because it'll just ruin it. It's quite poetic. It's quite poetic. Um, of course, God is being gracious, but so much was lost. So much was lost. Um, as they, the, the, that generation that remembered the previous temple sees the foundation laid for the new temple, um, they're moved to tears, to weeping over what's been lost. Um, there's others shouting for joy at what the Lord has done. I, just, I find it extremely poignant, poetic. There's all kinds of parallels I can think of, but I just don't want to make too much of it um, and destroy it in its own context. I mean, I think that there's a sense in which, um, there's a sense, a sense in which the now but not yet of the Christian life really echoes here. Has God, has God saved us from our sins? 
Yes, rejoice, but are we still in them? Yes, weeping. And there's a kind of weeping and rejoicing at this intermediate state, this imperfect state. There's a weeping and a rejoicing at this intermediate temple, this imperfect state between the temple of Solomon, intermediate temple, the greatest temple of Christ. Um, in the intermediate state, there's weeping and rejoicing. There's now and not yet. And I find a, a parallel to that in the Christian life and in what we're experiencing now. Um, so resonate with that as you will or not. Um, I'm not offended. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating part of Ezra. As if we needed it, we certainly didn't, but it's also just one more proof that this isn't a myth and this isn't a book written to make everybody look better than they are. <laughs> you know, this isn't, and then elephants danced around in circles while everyone blew their horns and there was a party like there had never been. No, there's a recognition of uh, the reality of the historical occurrence and the reality of the mixed emotions of the people. All right, any other thoughts or any thoughts you want to bring to the forefront as we conclude chapter three? You know, to further, to further the point that Vicar brought out that there are some parallels between this and the coming out of the Exodus. There's continuity and discontinuity, of course. We can think immediately of great differences between the two. Um, there, is, there is similarity, there is continuity. And on the study note of uh, verse 11, if you drop down for he is good in regard to that phrase that they were singing, responsively. This is a common refrain of praise to God based on Exodus 34, 6 through 7. Dropping down to the next study note, you can see in regard to the old men weeping, their memories went back 50 years to the grandeur of the first house, built with resources of Solomon's empire. No doubt some of the tears were salted with remorse over the folly that had destroyed temple and nation. The glory had, quote unquote, departed from Israel, 1 Samuel 4.21, because um, their great guilt, quote, mounted up to the heavens, end quote. I mean, in the most formal or proper sense, that's God's own presence, the glory that inhabits the temple. And as they're building the temple, they're realizing that, you know, in the same way that he once dwelt with them, he doesn't any longer. Now that's going to be, that's going to be changed. And then, of course, some shouted aloud for joy. Many other voices were raised in thanksgiving for this new beginning. Their shouts were heard far away. All right. suspiciously drama free until now chapter four now when the adversaries of judah and uh, benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the lord the god of israel they approached zerubbabel remember he's the functioning prince or you know i mean i don't want to read too much into this he's kind of the left hand kingdom guy from our view um, he's the civil leader, so to speak. All right, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Okay, so this is like going all the way back. Remember the king of Assyria when he took away the ten and then he put the people back in and there's not these super clean borders, so they're coming down and they're worshiping Yahweh. But how are they worshiping Yahweh? I guess one of many gods on the worship menu. What do you feel like today? I don't know. I think I'll have a number three. All right, that's Yahweh mixed with ba little Baal. Uh, <laughs> now this was, so they're basically saying, hey, look, we've worshiped this god <clears throat> along with all our other gods, can we, we'd like to help you. We'd like, I, I mean, frankly, just from a worldly view, 
This is a very neighborly thing. This is a very friendly thing. And the pragmatic lure of having help, extra hands, extra finances, all of the above, uh, this must have been quite the temptation. Verse 3, but Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to him, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. Can you hear the cheering and can you hear the angels rejoicing? But we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. All right, well, you know, this, this may have also afforded them some peace. We recognize earlier on there, at least, there were some hostilities and, you know, maybe there was a change of heart here, maybe this, some different groups, who knows, hard to say. Either way, this would have had all the pragmatic value in the world for them to accept this partnership. Praise be to God, they didn't. And so they, they committed themselves to worshiping Yahweh and Yahweh alone, the exclusivity there. That's always been the problem. In the Old Testament, that was always the problem. Not that you worshipped Yahweh, but that you worshipped Yahweh alone. Throughout the history of the church, wherever, wherever uh, persecution has arisen, the problem isn't so much that you worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you worship Jesus, true God in human flesh. It's that you worship Him alone. It's that you refuse to be civil and worship our gods along with us. In fact, that was the charge of the early Romans against the Christians, is you are uncivilized because you will not worship our gods with us. Look, we'll worship Jesus too. We'll all worship everyone. Why can't you be civilized? Why can't you be enlightened? Um, it's also why the charge was leveled against Christians that we were atheists. You don't have enough gods. What do you mean, one God? <laughs> That's an atheistic view. Um, you, need to have, you need to have a theistic view, that is, we worship all deities. I find some parallels here. You can, um, you can very comfortably be a Christian in our nation um, as long as you worship all the other secular gods. And we don't call them theos, things like Baal and Ashtoreth, and we don't have those names. That would be too conspicuous. Here in this little corner of Satan's ant farm, he's convincing the world that he doesn't exist and that there are no such things as false gods and it's all just secular, it's all just neutral space. Uh, no, there's no such thing. Either it's dwelt by the Holy Spirit or the unholy spirit. And in the unholy spirit here has this facade of secularism where nobody's worshiping any, any false gods, of course. Um, the truth is they're everywhere. And as long as your Christianity fits in with, yeah, we worship this, and yeah, we fear that, and yeah, we, you know, kiss this ring if we have to, and bow this knee if we have to, and yeah, Jesus too, um, you'll get along swimmingly. But as soon as you say, no, Jesus only, and not this, and this is wrong, and that's an abomination, and no, I won't bend the knee to that. Well, as soon as you do that, hostilities come, don't they? Ah, we've already seen that. And unfortunately, it's likely to increase when it does when it does we just need to take a page from church history a page from the apostles a page from the old testament saints for centuries they avoided pragmatic compromises and worshiped yahweh worshiped jesus exclusively and so will we god willing all right, so this was a big rejection. Verse 4 of chapter 4. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and, and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. It's a fascinating thing. The faithful choose not to do what is pragmatic. And do they pay a price? Yes. They choose to be faithful to Yahweh exclusively. And is there a temporal price to be paid? Yes. What do we take away from this? Not to be discouraged. To make the same choice they made. To suffer the same consequences they suffered. Um, and to simply not fear. To simply entrust ourselves to the Lord. And, and resolve ourselves not to be swayed. 
So the people of the land, they were upset. They discouraged the people of Judah, made their life difficult, bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. We'll get into those details a little bit um, as we go along. Well, in fact, it, I mean, we may as well, we may as well just drop down to, um, if you look curiously, let's see. Yeah, look at those, look at the study note on verse three, the returned exiles, fearing they would commit themselves to a false worship, refused the author, uh, offer of these neighbors to jointly build the temple. They justified this refusal by citing Cyrus's order. And then, of course, the people of the land, this is the native population, a mixture of racial strains um, and blend of religious beliefs. References to 2 Kings, we saw this already. Later, they came to be known as Samaritans. And so we talked about this in 2 Kings, but um, again, we see the role of the Samaritans in this. And we see why at the time of Jesus, there's such bias against them. They were never viewed as being very helpful uh, to God's people. Jesus, of course, shows his extreme mercy and charity by often um, speaking positively about the Samaritans and in, indeed engaging a Samaritan woman. Uh, in theological discourse, proclaiming the gospel, converting her. Okay, and then the real thing I wanted to get to here before we close, verse 5. So the people of the land turned the Persian advisors and governing officials against the Judeans, not only with words, but also with money. And then here, Cyrus was evidently persuaded to back off from supporting the temple rebuilding. His successor, Cambyses, continued the same policy. The returnees had to wait until the second year of the third Persian king, Darius. Five, and his, he's dated 522 to 486 BC, before they were permitted to resume the project. A delay of some 15 years and a great loss of momentum. So then we're going to see, if, I think, Barry, as you mentioned, the, the, the preaching of Ezra and Nehemiah really has to do with kind of encouraging these people and getting them to restart and that kind of thing. Um, but there is... Um, I mean, again, you see all of God's grace. You see the devil trying to frustrate that in, in every way he can. You see the people fighting through the discouragement. I think you see parallels to like, you know, when churches apply for permits to do their work and the city's like, all right, five years later, how many tens of thousands of dollars later? Ah, yeah, frustrated at every, at every step. Um, so we'll hear more about this. We'll hear more about this as we go on. But suffice it to say, their faithfulness is met with a, with a temporal consequence and with a great setback. God is going to be gracious even through this, even though Satan is using the government and bureaucracy against them. And effectively, God will nonetheless see that they persevere. The Lord be with you.